Welcome, this is Guyana 411, a weekly program produced by the government information agency, GINA. I am Azim Khan. This week we will look at the efforts in linking the Americas to promote greater trade and economic development, what efforts are in place to reduce and ultimately eliminate gun crimes, and how we intend to celebrate Indigenous Heritage Month in September. Stay tuned. For a country like Guyana, which is strategically located among the Americas, having established infrastructure is pivotal to the catastrophic shift that can come through economic development. The country can be used as a major transshipment point, and the current administration understands this and so intends to focus its energies towards capitalizing on every conceivable advantage in this regard. Imagine being able to drive from one end of South America to the other, from French Guyana to Brazil, Venezuela and other connected countries. For Guyana, this would open up tremendous opportunities. Think of the new markets that farmers, manufacturers, and service providers would be able to tap into. Already, there is the Takatu Bridge linking Lethem with Brazil. However, for Guyana to fully maximize the trade benefits of this bridge, there is need for an all-weather road linking the commercial center along the coastline to Lethem. My government has set its sights to take this beautiful country which abound with natural, physical, mineral, water, productive human and other resources out of the morass into which it has found itself because of the previous administration. And build a better Guyana where sustainable socio-economic development and good governance will generate wealth for all our current and future generations. The Lyndon Latham Road serves not only as a crucial link to Guyana's interior, but it also links Guyana to Brazil and the rest of the Latin American region. And in a similar manner, it can link Brazil and the Latin American region to Suriname and further afield with all the traffic flowing through Guyana. We will re-enter into discussions with the Brazilians on the development of our hydro power capacity. Construct, sir, the promised Linden Letham All Weather Highway. Having such a paved network means Guyana's economic position will be significantly boosted as it will be opened up for trade which directly benefits communities along the network, but more importantly, gives the Guyanese people the chance to exploit new trade opportunities. That is a, a hallmark project of ours. Um, right now, I mean, I, I, I know there have been plenty, numerous studies um, done for that, but right now what we are doing is a transportation study, not, a, and that is to determine which is the best and most economical solution for that route. We are committed to doing what it, but um, to doing that stretch, but maybe um, after the after that study, maybe it may be determined may have a light railway rather than just a road alone boat or even simply a road only. So that is a study that's being executed now um, so that we can actually make that determination and proceed apace immediately afterwards. Local traders having such a link will benefit tangibly from access to new markets, while service sectors like transportation will similarly realize growth. The administration is additionally eyeing the construction of a permanent bridge across the Quarantine River, which will serve to link it with Suriname. With a completed bridge linking Guyana to Suriname, one can drive from Bovis to Brazil to French Guyana and the opportunities which the varying industries in Guyana would benefit from this level of opening up are exponential. Naturally, we realize that size imposes major constraints on the countries, the size of ours in the Caribbean. And in order to overcome the question of size, you have really to pursue in an assiduous and meaningful manner the question of regional integration. We share too many common interests to allow these uh, to be overlooked. And regional integration on the basis of what I call concentric circles uh, will be the basic pillar of our international relations. Mr. Speaker, we firmly believe that the path to greater prosperity 
for this country lies in deeper integration within the region as well as with the rest of the world. We believe that in moving forward on this front, particular emphasis will need to be placed on a more strategic approach to our participation in various regional and sub-regional mechanisms. The initiative for the integration of the regional infrastructure of South America is a development plan to link South America's economies through new transportation, energy, and the telecommunications projects. The investments that come with this plan will deliver greater trade in isolated regions and create a South American community of nations. The idea of decentralizing public services to increase efficiency and decrease transportation costs among the citizenry is one of the functions of the new Ministry of Citizenship. This was one of the promises on the coalition government's 100-day plan to ensure its achievement so as to bring relief to those Guyanese living outside of the capital city as well as those in Guyana's hinterland. It is the aim of the administration to make life more advanced and easier for Guyanese living in every part of the country. Only a few months at the helm of managing the affairs of state, government is already demonstrating its intentions of fulfilling the commitments made to Guyanese. Weekly distribution of passports has been regularized with centers operating in Corriveton, New Amsterdam, Perica, Anna Regina, Bartica and Lethem. Work is in progress on birth certificate and licensing offices. The Ministry of Citizenship continues to look at different ways in which persons living outside of Georgetown can be relieved of the burden of traveling to the city to have passports and birth certificate applications made and subsequently uplifted. We can receive applications online where that is necessary. We would progressively be moving towards that sort of activity given that we get the fiber optic cable and the, the, the going, the, once we get the infrastructure available, we can then start considering the, a paperless system where, again, insofar as the infrastructure will allow us, we will receive applications for passports online. That is an area um, being considered on our long-term projections. Government is moving to address the delays experienced by citizens seeking to acquire or renew passports, especially those from the diaspora. The four to five months taken to acquire this travel document was brought to the attention of President David Granger and several other ministers during recent overseas trips. To this end, the 2015 national budget has allotted $9.7 million for the acquisition of specialized equipment for the production of machine-readable passports. This should see the waiting time reduced to five days, especially for those in the diaspora. The current administration upon taking office in May worked assiduously to meet the September 2015 deadline for correcting the deficiencies that existed in Guyana's anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism legislation. Guyana was asked to urgently address deficiencies in its anti-money laundering countering the financing of terrorism legislation. Specifically, the country had to fully criminalize money laundering and terrorist financing offenses, address all the requirements on beneficial ownership, strengthen the requirement for suspicious transactions reporting, international cooperation and the freezing and the confiscating of terrorist assets, and fully implement the UN conventions. This bill is the result of tremendous efforts and inputs of a wide cross-section of people and entities that are involved in the fight against the twin evils of money laundering and financing of terrorism. These legislative amendments, therefore, Mr. Speaker, represent our government's firm resolve to fight the scourge of money laundering and terrorist financing. Traditionally, legislation that speaks to anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorist activities focused on licensed financial institutions such as banks, money transfer service providers, cambios, and other financial entities. However, the new piece of legislation increases the scope to include designated non-financial businesses and professions such as card dealers, gambling and cooperatives, gold traders and pawnbrokers. 
It also introduces enhanced penalties and sanctions whilst providing more authority to supervisory authorities. The impact of money laundering on a country's financial system can be quite severe. It could lead to large-scale insolvencies which can arise if financial institutions' balance sheets are not properly valued. If sections of the financial system is owned or controlled by criminal elements, the authorities may encounter difficulties supervising these institutions or identifying problems where financial stability is compromised. Reputations may be put at stake. There are reputational risks for recipient financial institutions, both customers, borrowers, and depositors, even investors, can cease doing business with these institutions. Funds placed on deposit with a bank by money launderers cannot be relied upon as a stable source of funding for, interme for intermediation, which is a key function of the banking sector. The impact of money laundering on the broader economy is no less daunting. If the illegal sector forms a significant part of the economy, and criminal proceeds are withheld from the formal banking system, then official data on such things as employment, consumption, foreign exchange movement, etc., will not reflect the economic reality in the country because policymakers will have a difficulty understanding the state of the economy and formulating appropriate economic policies. Well, a lot of the the ABC ambassadors have indicated that you know, they feel that the passage of the act itself, the amendment act, would have done a lot to go towards being a fully compliant. And then the recommendations of us are being completed and laid in the, in the parliament. So we believe that we are on a proper footing. Now that the necessary legislative framework is in place to ensure that Guyana is fully compliant with the Financial Action Task Force requirements, other steps are being taken to ensure the overall institutional capacity for enforcement will be in place. The additional measures saw the Attorney General attending a ministerial meeting recently dealing with institutional strengthening and enhancing the capacity of the implementing organization. The amendments to this bill and the consequential amendments to the related acts were based on recommendations made by the Caribbean Action Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, or CIFATEF. And so, Mr. Speaker, we are now at this position where this bill is now before this Honorable House for passage. The main changes that we had proposed to the Parent Act related to the question of governance. And so we added new section seven and seven A to correct a situation where the director of the FIU was appointed by the Minister of Finance. We all know who he then was at the time. And he could be dismissed by the president, who we also know who he then was. This obviously was an untenable situation in light of the fact that since 2000, there was an anti-money laundering act, nothing happened on it and under that administration. No one was ever, as far as we know, investigated. No one was ever charged. Certainly, no one was ever convicted. And in 2009, that regime was enhanced with the addition of countering the financing of terrorism. And so we had a, an AML CFT bill in 2009, and it created this institution of the director of the FIU, which had largely investigative powers. Equally, nothing was done under that act. And as we said, that person was totally under the control of the PPP government. And we propose to change that by putting in an independent authority over the FIU and its director. And so we propose that there would be a 10-man authority. We have certain criteria for those 10 members. They must be, they must be of good character, integrity, and such like. 
and then we also have qualifications that they must satisfy. In addition to that, they would be appointed by a transparent process, that is, by the appointive committee of the National Assembly of Guyana. And the nominee or the persons identified by that appointive committee of this honorable house would have to come to the floor of the house for ratification and approval. The Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF, is an organization of 27 jurisdictions of the Caribbean Basin region. These have all agreed to implement the international standard for anti-money laundering and combating the financing of terrorism, Financial Action Task Force recommendations. In order to protect the international financial system from money laundering and financing of terrorism risks and to ensure greater compliance with the standards, the CFATF identifies jurisdictions that have strategic deficiencies and works with them to address those deficiencies that pose a risk to the international financial system. Persons have one month to hand in illegal firearms or face the full force of the law if caught with them afterwards. This is the warning of the Public Security Minister as the administration's efforts continue to make Guyanas safe. The decision of Vice President and Minister of Public Security, Kemraj Ramjitan, to implement a limited amnesty for persons to hand over illegal firearms to the Guyana Police Force is set to take effect from September 1. The measure is just one of several being put in place as part of the overall effort to curb violent gun crimes. It is just an option that we have and one tool in the toolbox, as it were. We have to do a lot more to prevent these arms and ammunition from coming in through the very long borders that we have in Brazil and in Venezuela, and even those who are bringing in through customs security, bypassing customs security when they send in these big containers, loads of goods, as we have seen on some occasions where guns have been found by the customs authority with goods coming into the country. Um, so it's going to be a difficult task. A lot of the Taurus revolvers that we see around the place are from Brazilian made. Many are from American made and some from other Latin American countries and so on. And uh, it's going to be a very difficult thing. Um, but we are trying and one of the things that we have to try is this option of voluntary handing over to the police station um, that will be designated to ensure that we at least have some through that method. The Ghana Police Force is keen to have the program and for the minister, it is important that the amnesty be implemented as an option. It has been tried out in other countries and uh, it is a useful option really uh, that we can do, uh, to take for purposes of ensuring that we do this um, help in this high crime speed that we have. After this period, those found with illegal firearms will face the full force of the law. Because you're granting an amnesty and if indeed you go to their homes or you get information and you find it in their possession, they'll have to pay the penalty. And the penalty is largely a jail term for being in a lawful possession of firearms. The rise in violent crimes has seen government move to set up a joint task force to find solutions to address this challenge. The gun amnesty is just one of a raft of measures being put in place to ensure that citizens can live and go about their business in a safe and secure environment. The rich and diverse culture of Guyana's First People is showcased during the annual Indigenous Heritage Month celebrations observed annually during the month of September. This year's activities will be celebrated under the theme Preserving Indigenous Customs and Traditions. Amerindian Heritage Month has its beginnings in Amerindian commemoration of 10 to September 1957, the day that Stephen Campbell became Guyana's first Amerindian Member of Parliament. On September 10, 1995, Guyana's then Prime Minister Teddy Jagan officially designated September as Amerindian Heritage Month in memory of Campbell's achievement. During the month-long celebration, indigenous peoples across the country have the opportunity to share their way of life with the rest of Guyana. Come on, 
distinctive languages of the Waros, Arawaks, and Wapushiana, and the Caribs, Amerindians are known for their craft-making skills and unique array of foods that are usually made from cassava and other ground provisions. As such, the heritage celebrations allow for the wider Guyanese populace to experience the indigenous culture in a profound way. From the 2nd to the 6th, we'll have a cultural extravaganza whereby we're bringing um, culture groups from various hinterland villages. We're trying to touch all the hinterland villages. We have the Santa Rosa Banchikili, which is a very, very popular type of music, indigenous with a touch of uh, Espanol in it. Very, very, very nice. I like it. Uh, they're very good at it, and that I, I would like to develop. You have the Yakarawa group. It's a group of dancers from Quibana. They will be coming. And you have the Kabukaburi culture group and Mr. Couchman. You have a group coming from Santa Mission. You have the Banakari culture group. Oriella, Mr. Andy Penu will be coming. And I think in grid culture group. We're also going to have the Arikuna rapper. I don't know if you're okay with him. <laughs> The Karadano culture group is Claudar and, um, and Karasabai. Of course, Surama and Sand Creek. We are also going to have the Masa Canary culture group. Apart from the various villages celebrations, activities planned for this event include a heritage launch, food and craft exhibition, a cultural extravaganza, sports and family fun day, heritage pageant, and a fundraising event on the reflection of the life of Stephen Campbell. Ay, 
nyap nyap tom nyap nyap wa wa dani wa dani nyap 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 Traditionally, these activities are launched at the Yumaneyana, an historic building which was destroyed by fire in the midst of the celebration in 2014. The Yumaneyana represents the recognition of Armenian culture in Guyana. We urge the Guyanese public to join us in heritage celebrations wherever you are. Get to the nearest village if you can't come down to the heritage village to, to join us on the, at the official launch. There will be lots of activities all across the country. All 187 indigenous communities will have celebrations, different forms, different times. And of course, plans are way um, advanced as far as the Heritage Games are concerned. Those games are really um, form the hub of the, of the activities that will, that will bring young people together from all, all across the country. So yes, heritage, the planning is way advanced, the expectations are high, and we believe that this is going to be the biggest heritage celebrations yet. So there's a lot to look forward to, a lot to expect, lots to eat, lots to drink. Choosing the National Heritage Village has now become enshrined in the annual heritage celebrations. Last year, village was Caro, Region 7, and this year the spotlight is on Santa Mission, located in the Essequibo River of Region 3. Santa Mission has a population of approximately 350 people. Apart from the traditional hunting, fishing, and farming, the community's main economic activities are ecotourism and forestry. At the Heritage Village, the residents are given the opportunity to share their way of life, traditions, culture, and achievements with the rest of Guyana. This year, Guyana celebrates its 21st Indigenous celebration, where Armenians have the opportunity to share their way of life, traditions, culture and achievement with the rest of Guyana. Thank you for watching Guyana 411. See you next week. Until then, be good citizens, look out for each other and keep your environment clean. Goodbye.